So, hello everyone, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I was very excited, slash slightly dismayed by our conversation at the end of the last session because it's talking about exactly what I'm going for. So hopefully it's useful to some of you, hopefully some of my fund has not been stolen too much, but we'll see how we go. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the reduction of cost surfaces. So these are what uh, one person mentioned as affordance surfaces, the sort of friction that takes you to move from one place to another. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the variables that are used to make those and possibly the sort of codes of best practice you can go for a couple of experiments that I've been looking at. Just a bit of background on myself. So I'm a Bronze Age archaeologist based in Britain. I'm basically trying to analyse the location of Bronze Age settlements and say, well, where can you get to in a day? Now, as I'm doing a PhD, I thought, well, I could do Euclidean surfaces, but much better to get look, use cost surfaces to define that region much more, uh, much more efficiently, I suppose. So, just a bit of background for anyone not familiar, um, to clarify what exactly a least cost path is versus a cost surface. So we've got this image here from Howie 2007, which I think is really useful to explain it. Now, a least cost path is, as Michelle pointed out, these long squiggly lines between often two points. You can sometimes have them networked between lots of other nodes. Now, what these use is what's called a friction surface or a cost surface, which is this black and white grey uh, map in the background. And what these define is how much energy or cost is required to travel between those cells. Now, these costs can be anything, so they can be known values like time or energy, but they can be more abstract concepts like stress or uh, you know, whether you prefer that or visibility. Now, we can't obviously easily quantify those with numbers, so I'm not going to be looking at those later ones, but I am going to be looking at time and energy. So, when I first started my PhD, I looked into the reviews about cost surface because I knew I wanted to use it, but I wasn't too familiar on it, and I found loads of reviews which uh, cited least cost path methods. So, everything they said was saying, so, if you used a Tobler algorithm versus a Naismith algorithm, you heard about those before with Michelle's talk, uh, this is the one to use, or these are the differences. But none of them really went into too much detail about how they affected the creation of cost surfaces. Um, there was some information in there useful to me, for example, what kind of spreading algorithms they use, and the different kinds of ways you can uh, map friction. So that's just what I've been talking about. Before I go any further, I think the most useful review I found was out by Merla Herzog in Internet Archaeology, which really has guided my study. Now, hers, again, was a study of least cost paths, but it, I think it's probably the most comprehensive review I've found, which talks about their creation and all the different variables you can or shouldn't use. So a lot of my work is built on there, so any of you familiar with this topic will probably do that, so that's why I'm making it quite explicit. So, having done my reading, I came across a couple of problems when it came to cost surface production, because none of the reviews I read talked about, all right, you should do this. Now, at a very basic uh, level, should I be what, what program should I be using? Um, for example, Grass is nice and open, anybody can use that, or ArcGIS, we're lucky enough to have a license at my university. Um, but equally, within those programs, what modules should I be using? So ArcGIS, you heard earlier, we have path distance, which provides an anti-isotropic uh, cost path, so basically it will depend on the direction you're moving, but it also has an isotropic version, which is cost surface. So which one should I use to produce an accurate cost surface? Now, there are no real results saying which one I should go for. Similarly, what raw data should I go for? Should I use a 50 meter coarse resolution DTM? Or should I go for the best kind of LIDAR data, which as you know uh, from a previous presentation, about 73% of the country is covered by that. Having made those decisions, which seem relatively easy, I suppose, I then have to go into the complicated area of talking, well, what, am I really, what costs am I really wanting to measure? Am I wanting to look at the way water slows you down or speeds you up in some circumstances? Am I interested in the terrain types? Am I interested in the way slope moves, as you find most people are? And then once I've chosen those, how do I rate those costs? Do I um, study them in about how fast you, um, you can move across those surfaces or how much energy? Are they essentially the same or are they different? Um, so this is exactly the problem I'm trying to solve with this presentation, at least to a certain extent. What I'll be showing is that you can't really just use one program with one resolution and uh, one uh, time. They're not equivalent. They do make significant differences in your cost surfaces. So you get a far more complicated picture like this. So I suspect the reason that um, big reviews of this data haven't been done, or at least haven't been published in the material I've read, is because you need a nice big data set of DTM resolutions at the very basic to establish that, and we're really lucky in Britain. So you heard, we've got all this geomatics data, 
um, unfortunately, I found in, in the areas I was looking at, it wasn't quite high res, uh, wasn't quite complete enough for me to use. But what we do have is this um, academically available ordnance survey data, which goes down to five meters. So that's great because we can interpolate that up to 25 meters, and then we also have a 50 meter DTM. So we can really start comparing the difference DTM resolution makes. Similarly, uh, we have great uh, access to terrain data. So. I suspect maybe the reason I haven't seen this before is we have the data here, so I wanted to take advantage of that and use that opportunity. So what I did was I chose 10 control points across the UK. Uh, these were all selected, they're not random points. I chose them specifically for um, a variation in slope. So for example, we've got nice high um, areas here which are really mountainous up in Scotland. And then we've got dead flat, literally, complete plain in the fence. Um, what I've then done around these is draw a 20 kilometer buffer. So I've got uh, 20 kilometer radii circles around each of those, and those are the landscapes I'm looking at. Each one of those covers a vary, uh, varying amounts of terrain, so hopefully I'll be able to analyze the different effects of terrain in there, but I haven't selected for those, so I just want to be quite clear about that. So what I've done is then use all of this data and created tons and tons and tons of different cost surfaces. Literally, I've filled up about three memory sticks now of <laughs> data, and I've got 100 gigabytes of rasters, all of which um, I've been comparing against one another to assess the effect. And I have this data with me. I'm very happy to share it with you, and very happy to use it a bit further if you have any other ideas about comparisons I could do. So, very basic one first. What resolution should you use when you're doing cost surface analysis? So as I said, I went for a 50 meter DTM, a 25 meter and a five meter. What you can then do is run a path distance module or use the R walk function in GRASS to produce these cost surfaces. Now, when I first started this in the sort of uh, early years of my PhD, I was just producing very, very basic uh, contour maps like these. So these are 30 meter intervals and then putting other contour maps on top of it. But that wasn't really helping me identify the difference in um, path or cost surfaces that you were producing. So instead, what I tried to do was then minus one DTM from the other. So essentially, what you're saying is, if the DTMs were producing identical results, minusing one from the other should have a zero, there should be zero variation, and you have a completely flat uh, plane. What this shows is actually the variation in 1.5 minute intervals. So I'll just zoom in on that a second. So you can see they're not the same. So changing the resolution of the raster does affect the cost surface that you're making. All right, pretty obvious statement. The great thing about that, though, is that we can take that data um, using our catalog and start finding some statistics about it, which we can start chucking into tables and then making some interesting graphs about. So that's what I did across all of the methods I had off all, um, off all the control points, and I'm going to be showing the results of those uh, now. So I appreciate this is uh, quite poor detail. I'm going to zoom in on these, but what I wanted you all to see at the first point is these are simple box plots, essentially, only with dots because Excel's NAF that way. Um, what we have is a similar patterns in all of these in that the mean, the gray dots, are all below the zero line. They all have maxes which are quite high up. I'll come on to those in a minute. But the point is the standard deviation line. So hopefully you can see from that that they are all pretty similar. So I can zoom in on these and explain them in a bit more detail. So these are my box plots from uh, my first control point. That was that one of the fens that you saw. And the important points I want to make up is make up? I'm telling you the truth, I want to say. <laughs> We've got these uh, grey dots, which are your mean. So that's the average diff difference between the rasters. Now, the way this works is this is my 50 meter raster minusing the 5, my 25 meter minusing the 5, and then my 50 minusing the 25. Um, so th that, that gives you the sense of the differences. And then these are using different coefficients. So these are different methods. Now, across all of them, what you're finding is that your mean and the majority of standard deviation are well below the zero line in almost all circumstances. That's the distribution of the variation. So what that's telling you, and I can show you this, it's the same here for mountainous terrain, and it's the same for varied terrain. I mean, it's a very, very consistent picture. And that's giving you the common sense solution, but it's at least I've proven it for you all. But lowering the DTM resolution causes an underestimation of the time it takes for you to get from one place. Because basically what you're doing is you're smoothing over mountains. So these things which cause large amounts of friction are suddenly taken away. So very um, that's OK from there. The other thing that I found, which you saw on that first map, which was uh, with the colour in the background, is that variation increases as you get further away from the point, so you compound the error. That makes sense. Um, this is true in both ArcGIS and GRASS, which are the two programmes uh, varied. The other thing which I thought was surprising but somewhat reassuring for me was that the difference, though, between the error between your 5 metre and your 50 metre DTM, compared to your 5 metre and your 25, wasn't five times worse. So, I mean, if you want a really accurate um, cost service, some people suggest you should use 0.6 me uh, meters because that's how far you can step. 
Um, what this is showing is, although you'll get an underestimation of time, it's not five times worth it worse if you use a five times worse DTM. So I've settled on using 25 meters because basically it's to do with space and processing time. But with the caveat that I know it's going to be underestimating the time to a certain extent. So we've got an idea about what resolutions we should do and what the effect they go for. The next step is to decide what coefficients you're then using to create those frictions. So basically, how do I code, say, a five degree slope, how much friction do I think that's going to count for? Now, there's several ways. You could say how long it's going to take you to walk over that, or how much energy, or how many miles bars it's going to take to eat. Now, there's tons of different coefficients for both of them. So this is a, these are the coefficients you have for time. So basically coding by degrees how much friction, or actually how fast, so you go faster over uh, um, small slopes. You can see that here, um, which the uh, path distance and grass uses to work out your friction. So what I did was use all of these uh, formula. Um, so I, to be clear, I used the total hiking formula, Naismith's rule with the Langmuir correction, uh, another method I found which was devised by Marion Arroyo, and my own interpretation of the Naismith rule, which when I read it, basically I read it wrong, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. <laughs> It happens. Uh, so this is, these are all my 10 control points with each uh, with ISO lines. Um, I think these are three-hour ISO lines, so they're they're comparable to each other with each of those methods. Now, firstly, as I said, so my yellow one, you can see that's completely um, completely out of all of these. So I, I'm just off the ball entirely. But the really nice and sort of confidence-inspiring thing is actually our blue, our yellow, and our red line, which are three different coefficients, are all pretty consistent. There is some variation, but we're talking even over the course of, say, eight hours, you're only going to be getting sort of 200, 300 meters further. So that variation isn't so extreme. So they do all agree with each other, um, which is hopefully what we'd expect. But it also means that when you're creating your cost surface or your least cost paths, well, no, actually, you strike that. When you're creating your cost surfaces, it doesn't matter too much which, um, which coefficient you use as long as you're uh, very clear about it. So then people can recreate your results. The case, that might not necessarily be true for uh, cost paths, though, because um, what happens when you're doing a cost effort? You're saying, well, how long does it take you to get from uh, here to all the way over there? Now, it might be you have a whacking mountain in the middle. But you can just go around that, and then it might be something which speeds you up on the way. The least cost path has to go around that. So I think least cost paths are actually a bit more sensitive to these uh, coefficients, but because I'm not dealing with those, I'm not too worried about that. Now, the other side of it is those results there were produced in uh, ArcGIS using the path distance module. Now, I did do some of the cost, uh, cost service module, but that's isotropic. I don't really want to compare those. I'm not so interested in that side of thing. What I am interested, though, is in the use of the program GRASS, which uses the R-walk function. So you saw that in Michelle's presentation. It's, it looks pretty complicated, but what I've done is actually recreate it in uh, ArcGIS, so they should produce the same results. So what I thought I'd do is compare what GRASS produced versus ArcGIS, and then also see what happens when you include the knight's move. Now, this is to do with what cells you um, were uh, you considering when you're looking at the direction of movement. Uh, I don't want to go into that too much, but basically it's meant to be more accurate. So what we have here are each of my 10 control points. Underneath, you have the regular uh, grass output, so that's without the knight's moves. In red, we have two-hour isolines with Naismith's rule. And in the blue, we have the grass isolines, which accounts for 7,200 seconds, so two, two hours. The reason, just as a sort of small point, that it's 7,200 seconds is um, that seems to be what grass thinks is an hour's walk in this case, because, I mean, it should be two hours, but what you'll find, what you can see is our blue lines and our red lines are tallying up really, really nicely. I don't really know why that is. There must be something I'm doing wrong in the process, but it's so consistent. I, I can't see where I'm doubling the uh, time. So maybe it's an error with the version of QGIS I'm using. Not entirely sure. But what you're seeing, anyway, if we compare our Knight's moves firstly, is that if you use Knight's move, you can get further, which is what we'd expect. Similarly, what we're actually finding is that the grass Naismith rule um, is very similar to the uh, ArcGIS Naismith rule, but they're not exact. Now, there's no reason for that. They're, these programs work on the same basis. So what this is uh, really reinforcing is that um, message from Geetle's review, which looked at these cost paths, that actually, even though we have same, similar programs, there must be something going on under the hood, which we can't affect unless you're a programmer and really get into the software, but it's causing variation, and I, I can't access that. So you do need to be aware of that when you're creating these. They're not replicable in other programs. So at this point, when I started seeing, oh, God, these are all producing relatively similar lines, albeit with a little bit of variation, I was like, well, 
are they worth the effort, essentially? Should I just redraw on Euclidean circles? This is just a little slide to prove that, no, you should be doing this. So what I've drawn is um, three-hour buffers. So how far, if you were going at five kilometers an hour, how far you'd get. And then using the Tobler, Tobler um, equation in ArcGIS and then our Knight's Move uh, grass, you can see that they're all within these lines. So it is worth, and actually, it's usually the difference is about 2.7 kilometers. So you do get less, you, you don't go as far if you, <laughs> if you account for slope. That's the important point. Now, um, I talked about you could measure friction in terms of time or in terms of energy. Now, when it comes to energy, there's far, how do we say it? There's far fewer uh, coefficients out there which people regularly cite. Um, so I've only got two here. One which is recommended by that review I talk, talked about, Herzog, which is a six-degree polynomial for any of you mathematicians, which best maps or best matches the scientifically observed data we have. The other one is a similar polynomial from Libera and Slokin. So I just wanted to compare those and see what, they, uh, what sort of cost surfaces they produced. Now, differently to my uh, time-based coefficients, which were all very consistent, what you can see here is actually there's quite a degree of variation. So these formulas are not the same. So it really does matter which one you're using, otherwise you're going to get completely different results. And it's pretty, it's pretty consistently different. So this is, a, this is the mean time, again, using that statistics, or it's not time, it's actually energy, you get between the two. And what you can see is it's consistently, um, it's the Manetti formula, which is about 70% smaller than uh, the uh, Libera one. So uh, Manetti says you need less energy to get the same distance, essentially. So they are different, but I wanted to see, well, does terrain affect them similarly? Um, and the way I did that was by normalizing them. And the simple answer is actually they do. So what I've done here is divide, basically calculate the friction in terms of a percentage. So where is 1% of the friction for all of these? And I've done that and created isobones. Now what you're seeing is actually that the uh, Tobler formula coefficient is very similar to our Libera and Slukin in the way it's affected by slope. That's consistent for all of the sides. What we do notice is actually that Manetti's uh, formula blows out a little bit, so there starts to be, it's affected differently by slope, um, which I think is interesting. So when you're choosing your formula, you need to bear that in mind. Now, uh, this is my last uh, sort of theme I want to be discussing, which is I'm just talking solely about slope so far. Now, as Michelle's been talking about, it's really, really important to talk about terrain. So what I wanted to do was assess, well, what happens when you use terrain and cost surfaces and actually see which is more important, slope or terrain. So that's what I'm going to be answering now. Unfortunately, we have far less data when it comes to uh, land cover. I'm going to be talking about this in uh, 20 or 40 minutes or so, so we'll, we'll, we'll save that for our next presentation. So what do we have here? So what I created was a... Uh, cost uh, surface across all the control points. This is just the one regularly with Tobler, so things you've been seeing before. Another one by adding the terrain. So this is what's an isotropic cost. You put this in the path distance formula as a little box, and you add more friction using those coefficients you saw on the slide before. And so what you, you see, there is a variation. Um, typically, the variation is uh, the by adding terrain, you go slower. Um, and you, know, you, you get about 80% of the distance that you usually would get. So you know, that makes sense because you're compounding friction. It's, you know, that does make sense. Um, what I wanted to do, though, as I said, is say, well, which is more important to uh, worry about, at least in Britain? So what I've done here is add where you would get if you uh, didn't have any friction, so those iso lines you had before. I've, uh, oh, no, that's, that's Tobler. Sorry, it's, uh, it's different to what I expected. So we have our Tobler iso line, so that's how far you'd get. You have only land cover, so those are in red. Let's try and zoom in a bit. Here we go, that's better. So we have our red ISO lines. So these ones represent only the friction if you include land cover, and the blue ones are those combined. Now, what you're finding here is actually the red line is always shorter than the total one. So friction is accounting for, you have more friction from the terrain than you do slope. And that's true across all the 10 control points, um, which was different to what I expected. Having a conversation, it does kind of make sense because you have consistent friction from terrain, whereas slope, you might just have one mountain to hop over or you can go around it. So actually, in your um, cost surface models, if you want to be studying anything, you should be studying terrain first and then slope. Ideally, you should be doing both. So I'm just going to skip that. So putting it all together uh, with answers. So what I found is... I personally prefer, prefer using ArcGIS. It's a similar reason to Michelle's paper. You can control the data you're putting in far more. Um, 
I had that problem with the uh, energy at uh, the time saying that we got to have 7,200 seconds with grass. I did have foibles with ArcGIS actually though, which is just funny. So ArcGIS 10.2.2 works, um, but 10.3, doesn't produce a thing. And that's not my computer. I've tried it on all of I don't know what's going wrong. There's complaints on forums about it, and it's the same with 10.3.1. So both both programs have their issues. I use 10.2.2. Um, sticking with resolution, 25 meters, I think that's the best compromise I can go for. When it comes to slope and terrain, I'm using both. Okay, just gonna come back to this. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that, uh, actually no, I'm gonna hold that. So. The way we uh, um, ended our last session was with this debate about, well, when people create sometimes least cost corridors, they just um, combine two cost surfaces, so two of those, and stack them on top of each other. So that tells you least cost path between two points. Now, all of the images I've been producing are actually how long it gets, takes you to get to that point, but not back. Now, those uh, frictions may not be the same. So what I would love to do, but I don't really have time to put into Path Builder, but I'd love to collaborate with anyone on that, is essentially doing what you see with intervisibility studies, where you stack all the visibilities, or in this case, all the cost surfaces, and what you then get is a true um, sort of cost catchment area, which tells you how long it takes you to get from A to B and back again, which obviously would be very useful for my work. So those are my main conclusions, just to summarise if anyone's got any questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'm an AHRC-funded uh, uh, PhD student, so I have to acknowledge them. Also, many thanks to... <laughs> no, I don't mean it that way, no. <laughs> but no, I mean, thank you very much for funding me. Similarly, thank you for Michelle, because we've been working on this a lot together, so your comments have been really, really useful. And of course, my supervisors and Lee for helping with the design. Any questions?